Good afternoon, and welcome to the Ross Doors fourth quarter and fiscal year 2019 earnings release conference call. The call will begin with prepared comments by management, followed by a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Before we get started, on behalf of Ross Doors, I would like to note that the comments made on this call will contain forward-looking statements regarding expectations about future growth and financial results, including sales and earnings forecasts, new store openings, and other matters that are based on the company's current forecast of aspects of its future business. These forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from historical performance or current expectations. Risk factors are included in today's press release and the company's Fiscal 2018 Form 10-K and Fiscal 2019 Form 10-Qs and 8-Ks on file with the SEC. Now I'd like to turn the call over to Barbara Rentler, Chief Executive Officer. Good afternoon. Joining me in our call today are Michael Hartung, Group President and Chief Operating Officer, Travis Marquette, Group Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, and Connie Cow, Vice President, Investor Relations. We'll begin our call today with a review of our fourth quarter and 2019 performance, followed by our outlook for 2020. Afterwards, we'll be happy to respond to any questions you may have. As noted in today's press release, we delivered strong sales and earnings gains for both the fourth quarter and fiscal year. Our ongoing ability to offer compelling bargains to our customers enabled us to achieve these results despite our own challenging multi-year comparisons in a fiercely competitive holiday season. Earnings per share for the 13 weeks ended February 1, 2020, grew 7% to $1.28 on net income of $456 million. For the 2019 fiscal year, earnings per share grew 8% to $4.60 compared to $4.26 in 2018. Net income was $1.7 billion up from $1.6 billion last year. Now let's, now let's turn to our recent sales results. For the 13 weeks ended February 1, 2020, total sales were $4.4 billion. Comparable store sales for the period rose 4% on top of a 4% gain in last year's fourth quarter. For the fiscal year, sales increased 7% to $16 billion, with same store sales up 3% on top of a 4% gain last year. For the fourth quarter, the best performing major merchandise area was children, while the Midwest was the strongest region. DD Discounts customers continue to respond positively to its merchandise assortments, leading to another quarter and year of robust gains in both sales and operating profits. As we ended 2019, total consolidated inventories were up 5% over the prior year, with packway levels at 46% of the total, similar to last year. Average in-store inventories at year-end were flat versus 2018. As noted in today's release, our board recently approved an increase in the quarterly cash dividend to 28.5 cents per share, up 12% over the prior year. The increases to our shareholders' payouts for 2020 reflect our ongoing confidence in the company's ability to generate significant amounts of cash after funding our growth and the other capital needs of our business. We have repurchased stocks as planned every year since 1993 and raised our cash dividend annually since its inception in 1994. This consistent record also reflects our continuing commitment to enhancing stockholder value and returns. Now Travis Marquette will provide further color on our 2019 results and details on our 2020 full year and first quarter guidance. Thank you, Barbara. As Barbara mentioned earlier, earnings per share for the fourth quarter in fiscal 2019 year were $1.28 and $4.60, respectively. These results compare to the fourth quarter of 2018 earnings per share of $1.20 and $4.26 for the year. As a reminder, our results for both the 2019 and 2018 fourth quarters and fiscal years reflect one-time non-cash gains of $0.02 cents and $0.07 cents per share, respectively, 
primarily related to the favorable resolution of tax matters. Now I'll discuss further details on our fourth quarter results. Our fourth quarter comparable store sales gain in the quarter was driven by a combination of higher traffic and an increase in the size of the average basket. Fourth quarter operating margin was 13.3% compared to 13.2% last year. Cost of goods sold increased 30 basis points in the quarter, mainly from higher distribution costs of 45 basis points due to unfavorable timing of packaway related expenses and higher wages. Merchandise margin declined five basis points, reflecting some pressure from tariffs. These higher expenses were partially offset by 10 basis points of lower buying costs, while freight and occupancy levered by five basis points each. SG&A for the quarter levered by 40 basis points, primarily due to lower incentive bonus and lower other miscellaneous costs. During the quarter, we repurchased 2.7 million shares of common stock for a total purchase price of $309 million. For the full year, we repurchased 12.3 million shares for an aggregate price of $1.275 billion. Now let's discuss our outlook for 2020. As noted in our press release, our guidance does not reflect the potential unknown impact from the evolving coronavirus outbreak. While we are closely monitoring the situation, there remains a high level of uncertainty over supply chain disruptions in China. In addition, it is unclear how a further possible spread of the coronavirus could negatively impact U.S. consumer demand. For the 52 weeks ending January 30th, 2021, we are forecasting earnings per share to be $4.67 to $4.88, which includes ongoing pressure from tariffs. The operating statement assumptions for fiscal 2020 include the following. Total sales are projected to grow 4 to 5%. Comparable store sales are expected to increase 1% to 2% on top of multiple years of strong gains. We plan to add about 100 stores this year, consisting of approximately 75 Ross and 25 DD's discounts locations. As usual, these numbers do not reflect our plans to close or relocate about 10 older stores. We project that operating margin for 2020 will be in the range of 13.0 to 13.2%, compared to 13.4% in 2019. The forecasted decline reflects our plans for merchandise gross margin pressure from ongoing tariffs and some deleveraging of expenses if same-store sales only increase 1% to 2%. Net interest income is estimated to be about $8 million. Our tax rate is projected to be approximately 24%. We expect average diluted shares outstanding to be about $351 million, Capital expenditures for 2020 are projected to be approximately $730 million, which includes investments for our next distribution center. And depreciation and amortization expense, inclusive of stock-based amortization, is forecasted to be about $490 million. Let's now move to our first quarter guidance. We are forecasting comparable store sales to be up 1% to 2%. Earnings per share are projected to be $1.16 to $1.21 versus $1.15 for the first quarter ended May 4, 2019. Other assumptions that support our first quarter guidance include the following. Total sales are planned to increase 4 to 5%. We expect to open 21 Roth and 7 DD's discount locations during the period. First quarter operating margin is projected to be 13.6 to 13.8% versus last year's 14.1%. This, this forecast reflects our expectation for some pressure on merchandise gross margin from the previously mentioned tariff, along with deleveraging on occupancy and other expenses on a comparable sales increase of 1% to 2%. Net interest income is estimated to be about $2 million. Our tax rate is expected to be approximately 23%. And finally, weighted average diluted shares outstanding are projected to be around $355 million. Now I'll turn the call back to Barbara for closing comments. Thank you, Travis. Again, we delivered solid sales and earnings gains for both the fourth quarter and fiscal year. Looking ahead, while we hope to do better, we continue to take a prudent approach to forecasting our business for 2020. Although we remain favorably positioned as an off-price retailer, we are facing our own strong long-term sales and earnings results, 
a very competitive retail landscape, unknown impact from the corona outbreak, and an uncertain macroeconomic and political environment. Longer term, though, we remain confident in our ability to achieve ongoing profitable market share gains by consistently offering customers outstanding value throughout our stores. As long as we remain focused on the careful execution of our strategies, we believe we can continue to deliver solid sales and earnings growth over time. At this point, we'd like to open up the poll and respond to any questions you might have. At this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. In order to allow everyone time for questions, we ask that you please limit yourselves to one question each. Your first question comes from Matthew Voss from J.P. Morgan. Great. Thanks, and congrats on a nice quarter. I guess, I guess maybe larger picture. So other than same-store sales at 1% to 2% and the associated revenue flow through, are there any material differences in your 2020 bottom line guide versus historically three to four comps equating to double-digit earnings growth? Matt, it's um, Michael Hartshorn. Um, as we have over a number of years and as we said in the remarks, there's a number of reasons to run the the business with a, a cautious eye, including our own sales and earnings comparisons, at the competitive retail landscape, and, and certainly the uncertain macro and political environment. The bottom line, though, is if we can put ourselves in the position to chase the business, we heighten our ability to optimize both sales and earnings results. Over the long term, our long-term algorithm has not changed, which is a combination of comp store growth, uh, new store growth, uh, EBIT margin uh, expansion at the high end of uh, three to four, and our share buyback program gets you to double-digit uh, comp growth, uh, double-digit EPS growth. And this Perfect. Is the, only other, the only other thing I'd call out is just as a reminder, we did have a, a two cent per share a benefit in the fourth quarter of 2019 that we're lapping. It was a one-time. Great. Event. And then maybe, Barbara, just to follow up, how would you describe the, the larger picture product availability in the marketplace today, maybe versus a year ago? And have you seen any changes as it relates to current supply chain disruption so far to date related to, uh, to all of the larger picture um, you know, changes that are happening? Sure. Um, versus a year ago, there's still currently, you know, a lot of supply in the market as it was last year. Um, as it relates to the whole China supply chain, you know, there still remains a high level of uncertainty with the disruption from China. So it's really kind of hard to project where that is going to go. Uh, but at this particular moment in time, there have been there have been goods. So, you know, whether later on there's an influx of goods or not, I just think it's too hard to predict at this point in time. Thanks for the color. Good luck. Your next question comes from Lorraine Hutchinson from Bank of America. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, just wanted to ask a question about the tariff pressure you're seeing. Is that pressure coming all from direct imports, or are you taking on some pricing pressure from some of your vendors? And are there any plans to try to raise price to offset these pressures? Sure, Lorraine. On the on the tariffs, the the largest impact is for goods that we uh, directly import. Uh, for us, it, that's areas uh, like home. Um, the home area has the 25% tariff. Um, how they played out last year was very similar to how we guided, and the way we um, guided into 2020 is mainly the front half of the year as we lap the 25% tariff uh, for tranche 3 and the 7.5% tariff on uh, tranche 4A. Um, for us on pricing, our focus is to maintain a value proposition uh, through a pricing umbrella relative to full price department stores and specialty stores. And to be honest, we have not seen a material change in pricing. Thank you. Your next question comes from Mark Alschwager with Baird. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. I uh, was hoping you could dig in um, a, a little bit more on the merchandise margin performance in the fourth quarter, how that compared to your internal plans and expectations. 
And then in, in terms of your, of your margin outlook for 2020, uh, specifically on the merge margin front, um, I know you just gave us some added color on how the tariffs are going to play out, but are, are there other factors embedded in that outlook? I know you'd mentioned the, the competitive environment. Just curious how you're looking at that relative to um, what you've been experiencing in recent quarters. Thank you. Um, I'll answer in, in terms of our outlook for 2020. Uh, with the tariffs, our guidance uh, includes a slight decline in merchandise margins uh, for the year. But, again, that's all driven by the uh, tariff impact mainly in the front half of the year. And in terms of Q4 for merchandise margins, it was down a little bit uh, uh, year over year. And, again, that did reflect some pressure from tariffs. But uh, it was a little bit better than we expected. Thank you. Your next question comes from Paul Trussell from Deutsche Bank. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for taking our questions. Um, I, I know you mentioned that um, I believe children's was the best performing category. Just curious if you can give a little bit more color on the rest of the areas, in particular uh, your ladies' business and, and how you feel um, about the trajectory of that business today going into the new year. Sure. Um, our overall performance was pretty broad-based. I know we, we called out children's, but the overall performance is broad-based across all the areas. Um, ladies performed above plan. Um, we feel pretty good about our current offering, and, you know, we believe that we have the right initiatives underway to, you know, drive sales growth in ladies um, in Q1 and for the year. So we feel like we're moving forward in that. Thank you. Your next, your next question comes from Kate Fitzsimmons from RBC Capital Markets. Yes, hi. Thank you very much for taking my question. Um, I, I guess, uh, you know, looking to 2020, when we're thinking about some of these non-merchandise items in COGS between uh, distribution and freight, um, is it, can you give us any guidance in terms of how we should think about that? You know, distribution seems like it was a, a drag here again in 4Q after being an item, uh, a, a drag in third quarter. So, you know, how should we look at that looking out to 2020 between the first half and the back half? Um, and again, on freight, you know, had been um, a pressure point more recently, but seems it turned to a, a leverage item in the fourth quarter. So uh, just how should we think about that into 2020? Thank you. Yeah, sure. In terms of uh, DC costs, again, as I mentioned, the higher DC costs in the quarter were driven primarily by unfavorable pack-away related timing, but to a lesser extent, as I mentioned, by ongoing wage pressures. In terms of the, the outlook for that, again, we have built into our forecast or into our guidance some continuing pressure in the DCs, primarily from ongoing statutory wage increases. Um, and, and again, as I said, that's built into the guidance. In terms of freight, um, you know, overall during the year, freight played out kind of as we expected it would during the year. I think uh, at the beginning we talked about that we'd expect higher costs at the start of the year. Those costs would abate uh, towards the back half of the year, which is how it played out to a slight tailwind. Um, uh, in terms of freight, uh, as a reminder, sort of the majority of our shipments are completed under contract, so we're not uh, regularly exposed to the spot market. Uh, those contracts typically renewed towards the middle of the year. So we feel uh, pretty good about the outlook and, and believe it should be a relatively stable uh, perspective, at least for the first part of the year. Your next question comes from Kimberly Greenberger from Morgan Stanley. Great. Thank you. Um, a nice way to finish the year. My question, Barbara, is for you. Um, reflecting back on the first quarter last year with the 2% comp uh, for the quarter, I know that, uh, that that I think you were hoping uh, to do better, at least that's what you had articulated at the time, and there were some execution issues that you were addressing. Um, I'm wondering, looking out to the first quarter 2020 guidance for a 1% to 2% comp, um, it doesn't look like contemplated in that uh, estimate is any expectation of recovery um, relative to a, a softer comp comparison in Q1, but I'm wondering if you can just reflect on what happened last year. Uh, it seemed like the issues were certainly corrected throughout the year, and do you think there's an opportunity perhaps in Q1 to do better? Thanks. Sure. Um, so you're correct. Last year in Q1, um, with the two comp, our ladies' business was very difficult. 
Um, and actually, quite frankly, Q1 for us over the last two or three years has been a difficult a difficult quarter for us. You know, as, you know, ladies um, is a big piece of the business. You have more weather issues. You have tax refunds. There's a lot of noise in the first quarter. Um, so we feel it's prudent to plan the first quarter with a 1% to 2% and to chase our way back into the business. Um, the difference for a year ago versus today is that, to your point, as the year progressed, that ladies um, slightly, you know, improved each quarter as we went along. Um, and, you know, again, in the fourth quarter, the business performed slightly above our expectations. And so um, as we go forward, um, you know, lady, ladies perhaps will not be the drag that it was on the first quarter. But in the first quarter last year, that was, that was really our main driver. Does that answer your question, Kimberly? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, so would you say you're, you're sort of planning Q1 cautiously just because there have been uh, so many moving pieces in Q1 for the last few years that it, it just hasn't all necessarily panned out um, to be a more robust quarter? But um, stepping back, do you think there might be an opportunity or I guess uh, you sort of said it earlier. Your goal is to beat the, uh, the performance that you've laid out, um, and you think it's best to sort of plan conservatively, Chase. Is that the best way to think about it? Exactly. That you really, you really want, you know, it, it's been difficult for two or three years. We want to put our position, ourselves in a position to chase our way back, keep the goods turning, and take us into Q2 in a healthy position. Kimberly, I, I'd okay. also add that across retail, if you look at sequential performance, in Q1 versus the rest of the year, uh, performance has been down uh, from a comp perspective. And it's, it's unclear whether that's weather-driven or, as Barbara mentioned, tax refund timing. But there are a number of factors that retail has been soft in, in Q1, including us, obviously. So it makes the most sense for us to uh, be cautious and chase our way back into the business as both sales outperform. Very clear and helpful. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Barbara. Your next question comes from Alex Welvis from Goldman Sachs. Hi there. This is Brooke Rojan for Alex. Thanks so much for taking our question. Uh, we just had a quick question regarding uh, some of the category comments that you've shared earlier. Gifting was a key part of the holiday strategy this year. Can you share how that performed during the quarter? And then can you share a little bit of commentary regarding the performance of apparel versus home? Sure. Um, in terms of gifting, we were pleased with our gifting performance throughout the store. Um, it was one of our initiatives for the fourth quarter, um, and the customer definitely responded to to, um, to the assortment. So we felt very good about gifting, and as we go forward in 2020, we would continue to expand on, on our gifting assortment. Um, in, in terms of your question on apparel versus non-apparel, they perform relatively similarly uh, uh, in the quarter. Your next question comes from Adrienne Yee from Barclays. Good afternoon. Let me add my congratulations for a solid holiday. Um, I guess my first question is, Barbara, if you think back to the SARS, and I know it's completely different uh, time period, sourcing, et cetera, do you recall any, um, you know, any impact on inventory that might be, you know, something to think about as we go through the coronavirus? Um, and then, Michael, can you talk about your average hourly rate assumptions on wage for fiscal 20? Thank you very much. Um, well, in, in terms of SARS, which was a lot of years ago, I'm not even sure what job I had when SARS was here. <laughs> um, you know, look, I, I think the, the way to think about inventory and managing inventory, whether it's, you know, 18 years ago or today, it's the same thing. When, when there's a lot of volatility, in the outside world, you want to manage your plan and you want to manage your inventory as tightly as possible. You want to keep yourself flexible, nimble, and have liquidity. And I think, you know, although I might not have lived through the SARS experience myself at that point in time, it's the same metrics that, that you would, in an off-price model, that you would use to manage and control your business as you're, as you're kind of going through, you know, the issue at hand. Uh, in terms of... Go ahead. In terms of wages, um, as, as you probably know, we raised the minimum wage uh, in 2018 to $11 an hour. Um, there are many states, some which were heavily concentrated, whether it's the D.C.s 
or stores like uh, California. California is at a $13 average minimum wage. We'll be marching to uh, 15 over the next couple of years. But with, there's other municipalities that are built into our guidance. Um, in, term of, in terms of market rates, um, you know, we continue to make adjustments to compete for talent in, in many of our markets. So what we have built in, into our guidance is market-based adjustments where we know we'll need to increase plus the statutory increases. Um, yeah, that's what's, that's what's uh, built into uh, the existing guidance. Thank you. Best of luck. Your next question comes from Michael Benetti from Credit Suisse. Um, hey guys, uh, congrats on a nice holiday. Let me um, start with just a quick modeling question. I think in the in the revenue build at this time last year, you started guiding the year to same one to two comps, translating to five to six on revenue growth. Um, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, this year it translates to four to five. Did you say? Is there is there um, anything to call out on the on the non comp component there that that we should know about that causes that difference? No, I, I don't think there's anything different. Obviously, we're opening about 100 stores, which is similar to last year, so you're you're on a larger base. I think that's the, the only difference year over year. Okay. Um, thanks. And then on, I guess, on Mike Lee offered comments that if you can get to a three to four comp, you still have line of sight to double-digit type EPS growth and algorithm that we've you know, you've spoken to for many years. But, you know, now we're past things like the self-inflicted $11 wage um, inflation, and it seems like we were back to the kind of, you know, longer range we see it coming type minimum wage increases that you had um, before, but you're still speaking to wage inflation this year. Are there, are there other um, – the good guys that we add back to the to the way we think about your margins on a multi-year basis that should offset, it, you know, if you're going to have things like wage inflation higher on a go-forward basis than you had when you were, you know, when you started giving that kind of an algorithm in the past. Sure. Um, well, I start with 2019. Um, we ended the year with with a three comp, comp, and if you take out the one-time tax adjustments were very close to the double-digit growth and would have been double digits with a four comp. So in line with, with our algorithm, as we think about it going forward, certainly we've guided the year this year at one to two. If we exceed, you know, we'll see what, uh, what flow through happens on that. But uh, it's up to us to figure out how to be more efficient in the business as we see those wages come through. Um, a lot of the wage increases have been statutory increases um, that we have some foresight on and we'll work to uh, find costs throughout the business to be more efficient uh, as we go forward. Okay. Can I just ask one last one at a higher level? It seems, it seems to me that any kind of meaningful, you know, product uh, coming out of China delays, you know, given how fast your inventories turn, it just seems like, off price could be in a position where availability of inventory in the short term could be impacted. It, it didn't sound like you said anything today that you're, you're seeing that today. How much visibility do you think you have to that if, if there is an issue? And then I guess just theoretically, why would off price be well positioned if, you know, given what we know about how fast the inventory turns are and that there, you know, there were factories closed for a good amount of time here recently? Sure. Um. First, let me say that, you know, we're seeing a very active marketplace. You know, there's a lot of competition in the market. There are absolutely goods in the market, um, and there's a lot of competition for those goods. And you're right. You know, it's early, and it's unclear, you know, what the impact could be on the supply chain, because I'm sure, you know, it's hard to get clarity around what that looks like. Um, but sometimes there's, you know, people are bringing in goods. Um, and we also have pack away that we will use in this time frame to, to support our sales trends. And, um, you know, at some point, here's the point we don't know, at some point, it will catch up. And so our strategy is to keep ourselves, you know, flexible and nimble and, and in a position to take advantage of goods when they come in. And so that's kind of how we have ourselves set up. But there has been a lot of activity in the marketplace, um, you know, buying, buying goods. Immediately. Okay. Thanks a lot. Best of luck. And this time I'd like to remind everyone, in order to allow everyone time for questions, we ask that you please limit yourselves to one question each. Your next question comes from Ike Borchow from Wells Fargo. 
Hey, let me add my congrats on a, on a nice quarter, good end of the year. Um, uh, just to dig into the gross margin a little bit, uh, I know this is a bit nitpicky, but um, you called out tariff pressure to impact your Q3 as well as your Q4. Um, I believe your merch margin was, was up 20 basis points in Q3 and down a little in Q4. Is is that just a function of more tariff inventory flowing through, or, or, or is there something else on the merchandise margin line uh, in the fourth quarter relative to the third quarter that, that is worth no, that's worth uh, worth calling out? Yeah, I think as as the year went on, the impact from tariffs got larger, right? So, in particular, the tariffs that were put into place uh, in September um, uh, had a larger impact, and and the tariffs that were in place even earlier in the year, as the year went on, those started to actually arrive and flow through. So that's why the impact grew um, as we went through the year. And so, Travis, does that mean we should assume that until we lap this uh, this fourth quarter that we should assume potential slightly negative merch margins for the year? That's, is that what's embedded in your guidance? Yeah, our guidance is, is merch margins down a bit for next year, and it's more heavily weighted towards the front half of the year than the back half of the year. I, I guess you think about the timing of when the increases went in. So tranche three went in uh, in the June time frame from 15 to 25, and tranche four went in place in September. So even though they went in place, they start hitting a little bit later. So the, those are the two kind of key points that will will anniversary as we move into 2020. Your next question comes from Marnie Shapiro from Retail Tracker. Hey guys, congratulations on a great end of the year. Um, could we just talk a little bit about real estate? You guys have been pretty consistent opening up the same uh, or close to the same number of stores every year. Can you just talk about how many stores you renovate in a given year? Um, will you close about the same 10-ish stores this year as you usually do? And have there been any changes to um, the size of the stores or the kind of leases that you're getting given how many retailers have exited the space, particularly in, in these standalone places? Marnie, on the, on the real estate front, nothing has uh, changed dramatically for us. Um, we expect to open about 100 stores. Um, you know, the closures are in the one to two handfuls of stores that we'll consider closing uh, every year. Um, but uh, our view on the real estate market has, hasn't changed. There's, there's good availability, and we'll look at every site um, that fits our specific uh, specific requirements. Um, obviously, with store closures, that gives us uh, sites, plenty of sites to choose from. In terms of the overall uh, real estate market, we're not seeing a, a uh, the cost uh, front has been fairly stable. But our, our plan, uh, 100 stores a year, we're very comfortable with from both the store operations, uh, opening stores, and also uh, getting uh, the right sites for us. And on your question of existing stores, we do uh, touch or refresh a number of stores every year. Uh, for our capital spending for 2020, we'll probably spend about 20% of that total um, on existing stores between refreshes, remodels, and things like that. So uh, we do work to, to keep the stores uh, current for our customers. Your next question comes from Laura Champagne from Loop Capital. Thanks for taking my question. As you discuss the risks and try to plan for the risks around coronavirus, are you more worried about a um, slowdown in consumer traffic, or are you concerned about supply chain issues that you might not be able to offset with pack away? And, and to that end, have you seen any shift in traffic trends over the last week or two as the headlines have gotten worse? Yeah, I uh well, I think there's there's a couple of different aspects. Obviously, we're concerned about our associate safety. We're concerned about supply. We're concerned about um, what would happen with consumer demand if it spread further throughout the U.S. I think it's too early to uh, wait one or the other. Other than we're we're obviously um, watching it very closely and making decisions daily based on how it's evolving. Your next question comes from Bob Dribble from Guggenheim. Hi, um, just a couple of quick questions. Um, on the on the quarterly cadence, 
Was there any variation variation in the monthly, you know, November, December, January that you would call out? And just wondering, you know, on a geographic basis, you call out the Midwest, but you know, if you could maybe comment on, you know, California, any other, you know, big markets and how they performed, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Uh, generally, we don't provide specific trends within the quarter, but I would say that our strongest performance was during the December holiday selling period. Um, in terms of geographic performance, uh, as you mentioned, the, the Midwest was our strongest region. Other strong regions were the Mid-Atlantic and the Southeast. Um, Texas also performed, one of our larger regions performed a bit above the chain. California was, was roughly in line with the chain. Your next question comes from Jamie Merriman from Bernstein. Oh, thanks very much. Um, just to pick up on your comments earlier, Barbara, about um, you know your ability to use Packway if, if um, uh, supply chains do become more um, tight. Can you just talk philosophically about how you would think about that now and sort of what level of Packway you'd be comfortable with? Um, and then just given the sort of range of categories and, and brands, I guess would you expect that you could shift across different categories to the extent that, you know, one area becomes more constrained from a supply chain perspective? Thanks. Uh, sure. So let, let's start with – let me start from bottom go back to the top. Um, in terms of shifting money through categories, um, if we had the appropriate inventory and we could deliver the appropriate assortment and we needed to shift from one business to the other, we absolutely could because that's, that's what, our, what our model is about. Um, in terms of packaway level, um, our packaway level, I think at the peak, Michael, was about 50%. It was about 50%. Um, and we certainly have the ability to increase that and increase our capacity in our DCs if we needed to. So pack away based on would really be driven on the merchants coming back and saying what the deals are, what the product is, and is it really worthy of packing it away, and is it a good value? Because the the danger in all this is that you know um, all merchants across America just go out and buy goods, you know, for the sake of buying goods. So you really have to have size around that and what that looks like um, in terms of you know categories and brands and things that that you know go in pack away. Um, that very much depends on um, what we see and the value we can offer to the customer. So Packway is not consistent through every single business in the company. It's based off of opportunities that the merchants found in the market they, they think have great value that the customer will um, appreciate and, you know, satisfy her needs. Your next question comes from John Kernan from Cowan. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. On the packaway point, there was a fairly sizable impact on the gross margin, I think, on timing of packaway expenses. Is there any way for us to think about that in 2020 and anything, you know, in the, in the first quarter in terms of how that would flow through now that packaway has ticked back up uh, year over year and sequentially as a percentage of the inventory? For, for 2020, um, first of all, pack-away is one of the hardest things for us to predict in the business. It's really based on market dynamics. But typically for the full year, there's really a nominal impact. Um, it, where we see the timing differences are usually quarter-to-quarter -quarter timing differences and not for the full year. Your next question comes from Mike Baker from Nomura. Hi, uh, thanks. I just wanted to clarify, uh, did you say uh, at one point we were talking about some of the issues that are impacting overall retail, and I thought you said um, there are a number of factors that have been soft in retail, including you guys. So are you saying that your one quarter, your first quarter has been softer than you would otherwise expect because of things like tax refunds and, and the weather? Hi, Mike. No, I, what I was really referring to is if you look at comp growth throughout retail in the first quarter versus the rest of the year, the first quarter has been softer than the rest of the year across retail, and that's been true year over year for a number of years. So that's what we're referring to. Your next question comes from Simeon Siegel from BMO Capital. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, sorry if I missed it, but did you say what you're expecting for expense dollar growth next year? And then can you just remind us the difference in sales per store at Ross versus Deities? Thanks. 
Sure. On uh, sales per store, um, we wouldn't we wouldn't break out DDs uh, separately. We're in the uh, nine million dollar range per store across the chain. And can you clarify your first question? One moment, please. If I missed it. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I was asked for clarification on the first question. Sorry, the, just the SGNA, the expected SGNA dollar growth for next year, if you had given that. If we haven't provided the specifics uh, in terms of that, you know, below operating margin. Okay. All right, thanks. Best of luck for the year. Sure. Thanks. Your next question comes from Dana Telsey from Telsey Advisory Group. Good afternoon, everyone. As you think about the bucket to growth margin and the enhancements that you're looking to make in different categories like women's apparel, where do you see the opportunity for merchandise margin going forward? And with that, what is, what are any updates on shrink? Thank you. On the, on the shrink front, Dana, no, no real updates. We take our physical inventory in the third quarter and what we saw last year was uh, continued improvement over many years of improvement. So um, at this point, we wouldn't provide any other update in, in, versus what we saw in September last year. And in terms of merge margin, as we've said for uh, a while now, we continue to believe that the biggest opportunity for further improvements in merchandise margin is about plant sales. And that was our last question at this time. I will turn the call back over to Barbara Rentner for closing remarks. Thank you for joining us today and for your interest in Ross stores. Have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.